So yes, I got into data science by way of physics. I did my PhD at Stanford and did some wave propagation stuff, really uh, cool, interesting physics. Uh, I then moved to New York and I worked uh, in uh, analytics, like in applied mathematics at Columbia and at the Courant Institute at NYU. And then after that, I realized that I wanted to use data and analytics to solve impactful problems and, and things that had to do more with practical reality rather than uh, far away in the universe. I once met a professor of physics and I told him, yeah, I actually, you know, I left physics because I now work with real problems. He just, <laughs> he looked at me and he really didn't like it. And he said, really, what's more real than atoms in nature, you know? So I should stop saying that, but you guys know what I mean. So I'm also, I'm very passionate about encouraging young women to pursue careers in STEM because I was discouraged from doing so uh, at a young age in Mexico. So I, I continue to run initiatives to help inspire and encourage them uh, to do that. And I also, um, like um, Jesse said, I, uh, I'm the chief data scientist at Metis. Metis is part of Catlan, the education company. And we run data science training programs, uh, both boot camps as well as corporate training and professional development. So if you want more information about becoming a data scientist or learning a particular aspect of data science, uh, please uh, you know, come to us. And then finally, I, I co-host the, the fun Discovery Channel show, Outrageous Acts of Science, making outrageous uh, things that people do fun and entertaining and explaining the science behind them. And that's what uh, brought me to my passion for the Internet of Things, which is really a marriage of hardware and reality and things that we can touch and see with data and analytics. And Jared and I agreed that instead of doing a technical talk, I would uh, step back a little bit and talk to you guys about the future of things and a few pro talk to you about the stories of a few projects that I think are really pointing to some trends for this new world that we're about to enter. So there are about seven and a half billion people on Earth. That's a pretty large number. And when the internet started and we had our 32-bit addresses, there were about 4.3 billion of them. But we've totally blown that up. And we're way past that. Now, under the IPv6 protocol, we have 10 to the 38 addresses. That's four orders of magnitude larger than the number of atoms on the surface of the Earth, just to give you an idea. So it's really a huge number. But there's an even bigger thing than people on Earth, and that is connected things. You know, we're sort of on the cusp of this new world. We, you know, it's innovation has not quite begun yet, but we can see some trends. And these trillion connected things are sens sensors everywhere. We see appliances, cameras, pipelines, roads, bikes, footballs, plants, industrial plants, everywhere. So that old model of us looking at a computer screen is sort of dinosaurs for people uh, uh, being born in, in the next few years. One project that really captivated uh, my interest was done at MIT. And the idea is that if you put sensors somewhere in a, pro in a process that is normally invisible to, to us regularly, if you add intelligence to things as simple as trash, a lot of information comes out and patterns and behavior that by studying it could really enlighten what we do with data. So what they did is, this was in the city, uh, well, they did it in Seattle, and this is a New York map, but they, they, the project um, that I'm talking about did this in Seattle. What they did is they added a microchip, very much like the geolocation device that all your phones have, and they added it to many pieces of trash and they had volunteers in Seattle. And let's see what happened.
So, you know, at first, it looks like a pretty chaotic and random pattern, right? Everything kind of went everywhere. But a couple of weeks after people threw their trash away, people started to disassemble electronic products. And then markets started to emerge. So for example, uh, print cartridges ended up going to Mexico because apparently there's a market there for reusable print cartridges. And, and cell phone uh, batteries went to the East Coast and then traveled to who knows where. And so you know, people were informed about these processes. And something that happened to be invisible before this experiment was now visible for policymakers to say, hey, you know, there, I can actually interact with business makers and, and craft policy that's going to help people carry out these processes more efficiently. Another really cool story that captivated me was during Hurricane Sandy. The, a high school in New Jersey was actually studying how to use maps, geolocation, and basic data analysis. And during Sandy, uh, as you probably recall if you were here, it was very hard to find gas stations that were open. And so what happened is uh, the, I think the Department of Energy or somebody in government wanted to get in touch with the phone companies, Verizon, AT&T, and they're like, please let us know if you can give us your location data because that way I'll see if there's a lot of people stalling in line, that means the gas station is open. If I don't see anyone around that area, that means it's closed and I need to let people know where gas stations are open. Phone companies said, no way, you know, we can't uh, divulge that kind of data. We, you know, we, we're protecting our customers. Meanwhile, they were giving that data to, an, to the NSA and uh, all that, but they were protective. And so what, what uh, they did is they went to Waze. Who knows the app Waze, right? And so they went to them. It was created in Israel. And they went and they said, you, you know, do, in the contract of ways, the users agree to give up their location information as long as it's in aggregate form. And so they got ways to tell these high school kids where these cars using ways were. And eventually, these high school kids solved the problem. And it was amazing because the power of analytics given to the hands of a few students helped people know where to get gas in an emergency situation. And you know, it was a funny tweet. Somebody from the White House said, please, parents, allow these high school kids to stay uh, up you know, much longer than they normally would, because we need their help. Um, so now that uh, you know, processing is so cheap, and it's getting cheaper, we have sensors everywhere, everything is connected, and all of us data scientists are working to have more advanced analytics for everything to get to talk to uh, everything else. Things this uh, old model of us looking at a screen in a computer or in our iPhones is antiquity, right? Uh, so now we are in an era where we're inside the ecosystem. We are the data. We are the sensors. Who here has seen the movie Minority Report? Well, a lot of you. A road diverges in the desert. Lexus. The road you're on, John Anderton, no is the one less John Anderton. So this is the cool thing about this movie. In 1999, Steven Spielberg got together with a bunch of geeks from MIT. One of them was Peter Schwartz, who's uh, now an inventor at Salesforce. And he said, I want you guys to picture the world in 2080. It ended up being 2050. But he said, what does the future look like? And we already have this. He basically said, you know, there are scanners of Tom Cruise's retina, and then they, they put ads in space that are focused, are targeted only for him and are focused right in front of his eyes. I actually, for my PhD, worked in a location uh, device that focuses signals, wireless signals, in desired targeted locations so it could be used for marketing, for example. And we, we're already surrounded by ads that are targeted and location-wise are also focused where we're uh, most likely to see them. 
This is referred to in, in uh, some uh, communities as intimate computing. We're really like part of it. Um, Qualcomm deployed uh, the gimbal, which was uh, this uh, sort of uh, eye beacon uh, that was uh, that used geofencing, and they put them in stores. So imagine that you enter Macy's, and you have an app, you volunteer for the service, and you're shopping for clothes in a certain department. But now the, the app knows that your favorite shoes are on sale on the second floor. And so immediately the eye beacon senses your presence, and it sends immediately a, an ad saying, hey, those, the sh those shoes that you like, they're on sale on the second floor. They did this, and they had 11% more people, more click-through than the ads on the website of the store. This is my friend Dave Matthews. He's been an inventor in the Internet of Things since the 90s. And uh, Dave uh, has a company called New Air. He takes ambient signals, literally just from uh, Bluetooth, cellular data, Wi-Fi, while you guys are just resting here. He comes in and he takes all that data from your cell phones that's constantly beaming. And he wants to turn experiences uh, you know, ads into experiences. Instead of just having an ad that appears unwantedly, and he's, he's trying to create experiences for companies so that we interact with brands. And so this is something really cool that he did for Magnum, the ice cream, which is very popular in Europe, actually. Proximity marketing is an area we're really interested in because we have over three million Magnum ice cream cabinets globally. So imagine every Magnum ice cream cabinet is able to talk directly to consumers via their mobile phone at the right time, in the right place, with relevant messages and offers. It will be a game changer for us in terms of engagement and driving sales. Yeah, so I'm Dave Matthews. I'm founder of a company called New Air. And we take all the ambient radio data that's around us, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, cellular, and we create useful interactions to people. And we do this through an application that runs either on your phone or maybe in devices inside your home or inside your office. So we're going to use New Air's platform, proximity platform and beacon technology to allow people to find out what friends are nearby them and invite those friends to share an ice cream with them. He actually did this at Burning Man too, and I have never been, but apparently it was highly successful. <laughs> so we, you know, the age of agile analytics is really real right now because with all the data that surrounds us, companies no longer have to create products that are static. They, it's really a culture of innovation and experimentation. So you test something, you co-create products with uh, the customers that use them, and you innovate constantly. You iterate until you find the right processes. And so brands are actually giving up part of control, their control so that more customers can have a say in what they want for the product. And that's a huge change. It's subtle, but it's huge in terms of where we're going. Products no longer are just products, but they're platforms, they're services. Uh, we have, for example, uh, Rolls-Royce has uh, built also engines for air airplanes, turbine engines. And now in, they have sensors that detect when an engine needs to be repaired. And so it's now a platform. The, the, the actual value of it is no longer just the machine, the engine. It's that service that sends the relevant stakeholders a, a text or an email saying, hey, this thing is about to collapse. You've got to change or repair this engine. Now, how do we create value from all this data? That's the question that everybody asks, right? Like, we as data scientists get hired to try to do that at companies. And so one thing that's increasingly popular that I see coming uh, in to us uh, at Metis is, you know, how do we have a 360 de degree view of the consumer. Now that we have all these sensors, all these touch points, we have medical devices sending information about pills that are taken, like literally sending you know, Wi-Fi signals to the doctors or to the uh, uh, you know, uh, children of the grandparents that are taking them to know if they, they remembered. We have uh, chairs that send uh, signals about how many people sit on them. We have buildings that are intelligent. The word smart smart building, smart materials is, materials is so overused because all these touch points about the consumer are really coming together. 
So one thing that's really important for companies right now to use analytics for is to calculate what consumers love. Walmart, for example, which, was, which has hundreds of thousands of products in each store, at one point decided to ignore data scientists and they removed 15% of their products, simply ad hoc thinking, intuitive thinking, and they removed them thinking they're going to create a fancier experience, expand the aisles, Guess what? For seven consecutive quarters, they started to lose money. So then they brought in a kick-ass data science team who said, no, we need to know about you know, the analytics behind all of this. And so they started to analyze things such as demand transferability. So for example, if you don't care about the water you buy, People would equally exchange you know, the 24-pack brand, generic brand for a 12-pack of another you know, Walmart generic brand. But if you were a customer that cared about a special water, like vitamin water or uh, smart water, then if you did not find it at Walmart, you would not come back. And you would just choose another, altogether, a completely different uh, supermarket to, to shop at. So they were losing customers. So that was in 2009. So in, in 2015, they re-added, uh, they added back 11% of those products. And now they used analytics to remove uh, products you know, slowly. And now their profits are increasing like crazy again. So this shows us that the old business models are being challenged. And people are really trying to look at analytics as the veins of the organization. And everyone in, in, in a corporate setting needs to have some um, power over the data and needs to use the data somehow to inform decisions. This is a really cool thing that happened. Who has been to South by Southwest, the festival in Austin? Okay bunch of people. So what they did, Oreo uh, did this really cool experiment. We have 12 okay. different flavors, four different kind of configurations. So you can print like a half cookie 50%, you can print a swirl, and we can do different variations of that. So in total, we have about 4,000 different combinations that can be algorithmically decided. So it's very <laughs> difficult to say which one is everybody's favorite. The bottom line is Oreo is everybody's favorite in whatever flavor they taste. So one of the coolest things we've seen here at South by Southwest is the Oreo Trending Bending Lab. It takes trends from Twitter and then customizes those trends into a filling for the Oreo. So the one thing that we know is that the Oreo consumers love the various flavors that we have. But what we wanted to do was explore how can we actually pique the interest of new flavors for the consumers. And so what Trending Bending is, is it's uh, a 3D printed Oreo cookie based on what's trending on Twitter. So in partnership with Twitter, we've created an algorithm which actually lets us decide what cream to place on the cookie based on what's trending in real time. So to take a trend like South by Southwest and decide what that trend should taste like so that you can actually eat the tweet. I'm Deborah Borchardt reporting <laughs> for the street from South by Southwest in Austin. So there you go. It's all about making it personal. Uh, who here has either Google, Home, or Amazon Echo? Huh, a bunch of people. So, you know, you put together a voice recognition with a search engine, with a neural network, with other platforms such as YouTube, Amazon, and you have a pretty powerful assistant. Just as an aside, I found out yesterday that Amazon Echo is uh, undergoing some uh, stressful situation because an Amazon Echo was a witness to a crime they think. So they were, the person that was uh, in a crime scene said, confessed that there was some music playing. And so they now want the data in that Amazon Echo to, to present in trial, because maybe the Amazon Echo, because it's always on, heard something during the crime. But Amazon doesn't want to give it up because it's protecting privacy and the security of its customers. So it's like a whole battle that is very significant and telling about the kind of world that we're living in. So how do we deal? This is sort of like my, my ending uh, philo philosophical thinking here. How do we deal with so much complexity in this world? Uh, you know, how do we make our networks secure? And, and private when we need them in, in such a complex world of trillions of things that are talking to each other. Privacy, trust, and identity are no longer just some attributes that are good to have. 
they are becoming essential for loyalty and for growth. Volkswagen started a whole company in cybersecurity to prevent car hacking because they realized cars are, you know, electric cars and, and automated cars are super vulnerable. The interesting thing is they did a survey of millennials. 70% of them say that they would, exposure uh, of their personal information reduces their level, uh, their level of social media interaction. However, only 25% of them use measures to protect that information. So they, you know, only 11% use a virtual private network, uh, only, you know, 4% use anonymity software, uh, two-factor authentication, only 13%, encryption programs, only 9%. So people desire a level of privacy, but they're, they're really, like, not enacting it for whatever reason. I don't know if you've heard about this website called Have I Been Pawned? So I put my email in there. And if you put it, it actually tells you when that email has been compromised in different breaches of security. And it's pretty real, like so Dropbox had you know, that horrible uh, breach of security, LinkedIn, MySpace, Tumblr, Yahoo, et cetera. And so it tells you where it's been uh, compromised. There's a specific uh, search engine for Internet of Things. It's not Google, it's called Shodan. And for paid users, and you know, there's also a way to get this free. They have um, actually, so there's uh, called the RSTP, I think the real RTSP, real time streamlined protocol, that uh, is a protocol where all the media and all the video gets transmitted from d devices uh, to other devices. And so a lot of the cameras that you buy to monitor your homes, your kitchens, your babies, whatever, are actually not protected. They're not secure. So if you search, for that, I think it's a 54 protocol. Um, anyways, if you search for that, which I did, you find stuff like this, like a, ca a baby uh, in Canada. You find kitchens, uh, back rooms of banks. But I'm not talking a few hundreds. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of these things. So, you know, people don't, wor they worry about it, but they're not really doing things to protect these kind of devices. So, you know, I'm going to end by saying that all of us working in data science and analytics have a responsibility. We have to reimagine the products and the relationships of those products with the consumers. We have to reimagine the production chain, chains in a way that keeps our society in healthy, that keeps our future bright and our kids today secure. So the way we architect what we build is our destiny. Thank you.